This is a sea level rise scientist for Climate Central at Princeton. She started her career developing integrated water resource projects for the uh, World Conservation Union, the United Nations and uh, CDM Engineering in Jordan. She has a PhD in Public and International Affairs from Princeton University and she previously worked as liaison officer for the White House Subcommittee on Global Climate Change Research and uh, clim as, as a climate change expert. She has also worked on uh, the Sea Level Rise chapter for the IPCC Special Report on the Oceans. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here also because I'm, I'm local. Actually, I, I, Craig and I were talking about this that I should have said earlier. I actually am in the Columbia neighborhood, but go down to Princeton um, half the time. Um, so anyway, that's a fact about me. Um, so what I'd like to do is give you an overview of Climate Central because there's a lot that we do that many people may or may not be aware of and I think there are a lot of resources both for the public but also for scientists. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk a bit about, um, oops, sorry, my sea level, I'm in the sea level rise research program. We're a small but mighty group and um, what we like to do is show the impacts of sea level rise on something, on something that people care about. So for example, affordable housing, um, biodiversity and wetlands is something that I'll be talking about today. Um, so about Climate Central, as, as an overall, we are a non-advocacy um, climate science organization and we are um, a, a middleman between some science and the media. So we work closely with, um, we provide a lot of analyses to meteorologists who then show that on their network to the average American. Um, we're a small staff, 30 people, and it was founded just about 10 years ago, or more than that. Um, as I said, nonpartisan. And what we really love to do is make these impacts localized. Um, so it's evidence-based information on climate science impacts and more and more solutions. Um, so there are three main programs, Climate Matters, um, Partnerships Journalism, and Surging Seas really should be sea level rise. Um, so Climate Matters um, connects with, we have about 88% um, connection with U.S. media markets. Um, and these are meteorologists that every week get an analysis of how climate change is affecting something that's seasonally relevant. Um, and why local TV matters to some is it's still where a lot of people get their information. Um, so these are just some examples of meteorologists using um, our climate analyses. Um, and here's some just to give you a little taste of what it actually looks like. So. It's a really impressive group. I'm not a part of it except for one-off um, collaborations, but they look at you know cold weather, hot weather events, global temperature, um, how it affects allergy season, how it affects um, mosquitoes, unhealthy ozone days, and some of the most popular are the holidays, Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, how it just affects temperature around that time of year, um, football season, ah. Um, beer, so they have a lot of fun, but that's really how it becomes most powerful, right, is that aside from people in this group and our broader community, um, it takes a little bit of work to make other people care about climate and the way it intersects with their lives. Um, so there's also Climate Matters in the newsroom, and this goes to journalists, and so there are, are briefs that, um, it's the same kind of idea where they connect um, science analyses to um, local areas. And what partnership journalism does is that um, there's actually one person at Climate Central that does this, but he has quite an impact. He works closely with local reporters. And so one of the goals here is to improve um, local reporting on climate change, which really does not happen as much as one might hope. Um, so these are some of examples of, of his work, and um, they're on a small scale, but you know that's part of how we think he can help address this problem. Um, it's going beyond just the New York Times or major media outlets. Um, let's see. So another project that might be relevant here is something called amplifiers, and what we do is we amplify the research that others do, um, in addition to the research that we do to help it get out to the media. So we help um, synthesize 
um, some findings help it, with the graphics to make it communicate a, a, a story that um, the average American or somewhere else that we actually could understand a little bit better. Um, so in our field race program, we really have a few focus areas. One is maps that have been, we were one of the first people to put out detailed, detailed silverized maps, um, which I'll go through in a moment. Um, and really the idea is always to make this accessible to the public. Um, so some of my research is resilience of wetlands, affordable housing, how will um, it affect biodiversity, things that aren't always directly um, obvious. And here is seal rights. Just trying to, many people may have seen this and you can easily look it up, but I just wanted to show some of the things that are in here. So there's a lot of localized information that can be generated. Um, for water levels, that's any combination of sea level rise um, of tides and, and storm surge flooding. So people can explore what impacts might manifest from, from different scenarios. Um, and this information is actually being updated right now in our new website. But you can find you know, how many people, critical infrastructure, et cetera, is exposed to a certain amount of sea level rise plus flooding. And then the information to have, this is something I really like to tell people because I didn't know about it until I worked here, which is um, all of the, this, you know, the high level overview of the science and being transparent about what, what's going into these findings is available for people. Um, that's really critical, not for, you know, um, Joe on the, on the street, but for people like um, public policy officials or people in local government or people in, for example, Philadelphia, their, their water municipality, they come here a lot and they, um, they're very up to speed in general in terms of sea level rise projections and they understand what that means, but they want to have a deeper sense of um, you know, what's actually inside these numbers and how can they educate themselves more about that. Um, so there are also modules about, for example, this was a project uh, last year and the year before. It's been updated on Zillow showing um, what is, why, how many people are increasingly developing in the flood zone. And so we localize those numbers um, so that you know, anybody can have access to that. Um, this is an old version of the Surging Seas map, which is being updated. Um, and these are some of our most most visited images from um, a really young and talented photographer. You can see the differences with um, two degrees sea warming and four degrees sea warming that will not affect, will not happen anytime soon, but you know the long-term consequences of that amount of warming. Um, Mar-a-Lago, this is our <laughs> definitely before this last research that came out from Climate Central on Coastal Them, this was one of our most visited um, images and there's a lot of ones like these with iconic places, you know. So what we're really trying to do is show the story of sea level rise does matter and it does matter for, you know, some high level people, but, you know, we also show Venice and other really culturally important sites. Um, so I'll give you an overview of this wetlands project. It's about the re how resilient are our wetlands in the United States to sea level rise. Um, you probably don't have to tell the people in this room why we might care about wetlands, but they, they provide an immense amount of services for us, um, which can roughly be quantified. Um, so we do care about them, and obviously sea level is rising from human-caused climate change. And really, at the end of the day, I mean, this poses a huge long-term threat of their inundation. Um, in the United States, it's particularly relevant because we've already endured quite a bit of, of loss of wetlands, particularly in the South and Gulf areas. And it, it's hard to imagine how much we're actually losing, but an old study um, quoted roughly seven football fields every hour. And so it's an immense loss, and it's really important, and it's not a very um, flashy topic for the average person, but we think it was worth exploring. Um, so this is just ongoing development, erosion, et cetera. 
So wetlands can respond and, and society can do things to help them do so. So one of these mitigation measures that can be taken is vertical accretion. So that's the rise of wetland surface due to the buildup of sediment, organic matter, i.e. from damming, um, and there are other ways to control that at a higher level. So with enough sediment um, buildup, accretion, it can actually keep pace with sea level rise, but there is some limit to that, and that limit is not um, well understood, and it's gonna vary from place to place, and so far, you know, there's been great local research, but it's been in you know, just a few places, and, and we don't have a good understanding of, of what that universal max, max limit might be. Um, so if it's not able to accrete, uh, and it's outpaced by sea rise, obviously we could lose wetlands in that way. Um, a second way that they can mitigate the risk is by horizontal migration, and what we're calling refugia. So that's really just this low-lying, undeveloped land that could be available for um, wetlands to colonize as sea levels rise. Um, so again, if they're able, if wetlands are conserved, or I'm sorry, if refugia are conserved, wetlands can migrate into them. But if they're blocked by either seawalls and coastal protections and these trade-offs that many of us are very familiar with in terms of um, protecting uh, populations versus protecting the wetlands, um, they won't be able to grow into that area. So we wanted to better understand to what extent um, can these options help make uh, wetlands more resilient to sea level rise, and it's really unclear. So, so far the ability to understand um, how well wetlands can keep pace with sea level rise, it's been debated uh, in recent years. and. It, understandably so, these are complex systems, and, and there's a lot of uncertainty in the future development of the floodplain and uh, adjacent areas, and obviously the future rates of sea level rise, um, and accretion, as I said. So, um, you know, this really can't be assessed by the current suite of models. They're either global and, and too poor resolution, or they're localized and high resolution. Um, and they don't often account for that um, maximum limit in accretion rate um, or the full development of refugia, which could happen given recent trends, um, or projected and localized sea level rise, not just regional. Um, so the gap that we wanted to address is that you know, we want to have something that's at a local scale but across a broad area, so region or country, um, that captures the critical elements of these more complex models, such as the maximum accretion rate, um, and really focusing on the management options because that gives us some levers where we could intervene as a society. So to help answer this question, we um, stood on the shoulders of NOAA and advanced their wetland module. Um, but we advanced it in such a way so that we have a simple model with high resolution, wider elevation data, and we're able to then identify areas at risk and benefits possible from conserving refugia and managing accretion rates, and there's really gonna be a focus on um, supporting resilience planning. So it's really a series of model experiments in this case, and we're again examining the influence of long-term wetland change on conservation versus development of refugia, and the various possible maximum accretion rates across emission scenarios and sea level rise models. So just a few high-level um, findings from this is I'm, that... I'm sorry, you, when you're yeah. talking about accretion rates, it seems like you're missing this big chunk, which is like sediment loading. So if they, you, when you mentioned the seven football fields, a lot of that isn't it driven in Louisiana, mm -hmm. where it has a lot more to do with how the sediment loading of the Mississippi River Right. has been altered as opposed to just plain old like sea level rise or whatever else. Right. So do you do you have that component that well that was hydrology just, component that was just that an example here? for why why should we care why should we care about wetlands so I I didn't mean to conflate that research with this research they're they're very different so when we're talking about accretion rate it's not bottom up it's top down in the sense that there's a lots of lots of different factors that are going to affect that accretion rate and we're not controlling specifically for one or the other. We're just saying 
given all these things that could happen, if all together that results in three millimeters per year or five millimeters per year. Does that make sense? So yeah, there's going to be all these local things that happen. Yeah, but that three versus five has this big that maximum accretion rate, mm -hmm. the ground hydrology and how much sediment loading, whatever you know, area you're in has, mm -hmm. can also have anthropogenic impacts, but it, you have to have that. There's a whole modeling component there that's missing to get that number correct. Right, and we're not trying to get that number correct, To actually. even get it in the right order of magnitude. Well, there's, from different studies, what we did is we looked at the, the wide range of accretion rates that are possible. So we're not trying to attribute a particular maximum accretion rate at all. We're given, that's why it's a scenario-based approach. So we're, we're saying given if there was three, three, I'm sorry, three millimeters per year or 20 millimeters per year, what would be the impact? So we're not trying to attribute one or the other, just to give a sense, given that they're all, there are all these local factors and many are unknown. I mean, Louisiana is, is well trodden territory, but you're going to have other places that haven't had the resources for those kinds of localized studies. So that's, we're just trying to do a, a middle of the road approach where we have, um, you know, we're not trying to have localized data. Does that make sense? And we can talk more after. Right. And when, when you put in um, accretion, do you also take into account that there is uh, sediment compaction and subsidence that's being driven by that accretion so that the net elevation gain is less than the amount of accretion? Right. So just as I was saying, we're not attributing as a, it could be from many different factors. We're just saying if the accretion rate was uh, this amount versus this amount, what would be the impact on wetland change? So it's not a, a detailed um, model. It's, it's a simple model to give an indicator of the risk. Um, there's a lot more advanced work that's going to be at um, a smaller scale for a specific wetland, and that's not our goal. Our goal is to give an indicator that can help decision makers have a sense of, of what's at risk. Um, so at a state level, oh, sorry, I think I missed that. Um, under full development, only low emissions, along with a high maximum accretion rate, fully mitigate wetland loss by 2100 under these broad scenarios. Um, and even with low emission scenarios and an average max accretion rate, um, more than 90% of counties could face losses under full development. So there, there's a lot of sensitivity to the ability to migrate inland and um, of course, if we had extreme Antarctic ice melt, which um, this is based off of COP17, which we now understand to be um, a, a, a very worst case scenario. Um, so, but to give you that, that bound of possibilities. Um, under low emissions, low max accretion, and full development, more than 25% of county, counties could lose at least a third of their wetland area. So, um, you know, if these buckets of possibilities were to happen, there, there is quite a bit at risk. Again, we're not, we're not saying this is going to happen in any one specific area, but giving an indicator. Um, so we also also look for a, a tipping point in terms of how to get break even, so that you, how do you, where you avoid wetless loss, um, and show the amount of refugia that might be needed to do that. Um, under high max accretion and high emissions, one in ten counties do face wetland loss even with full conservation. Um, under full development and high end sea level rise, all counties could face some degree of wetland loss regardless of the max accretion rate. Um, and here we're using 20 millimeters per year, which is considered very high even in Louisiana. Um, under mid range, under mid range sea large model, COP14 and high emissions, really, and I mean the story always comes back to Louisiana, North Carolina, and Texas are, are highly at risk regardless of the accretion rate. And under low max accretion rate, there are hot spots um, across the board, uh, obviously. Um, and even with full conservation, some areas face wetland loss under nearly all bounding conditions. So 
what I think a takeaway here is, given the limitations that it's um, an indicator of risk, is that it, we do see that under these I idealized scenarios that protecting current refugia is a really critical factor for retaining wetlands under accelerating sea level rise. Um, and some other work, it was almost discussed as if that was a guarantee or that was um, a probable outcome, but I argue that given how we've been using land over the last century and beyond, um, that I think it will be something that will be a concerted effort to try and mitigate. Um, so overall, if conserved under a universal high max accretion rate and low emissions, um, wetlands could increase you know, by 25%, roughly by 2100. And of course, that, that could mean an annual gain in, in ecosystem services, but if they're developed under a very, very worst case scenario using um, rapid Antarctic ice sheet loss and low accretion, uh, low maximum accretion and um, high emissions, there could be a very, very significant decrease in wetlands. Um, and along with that, um, loss in ecosystem services. So, um, you know, the overall finding here is that there's despite this recent optimism, the resilience of wetlands, uh, it's heavily dependent on these conditions, um, all of which are uncertain. And our goal was to provide the best that's possible, actionable science that's scenario-based, sure, but to give uh, local planners a sense of what they may or may not have control over and what levers um, could help them increase the resilience of their wetland area and really, um, kind of going back to your question, that local studies measuring the actual response of historical sea level rise and other factors to um, what's going on, the dynamics in a wetland, um, are critical to help us better understand how to move forward. Um, so that was that. I'm not sure where we are with time, but I do have some slides on Coastal Dam if, if there's interest in that. <laughs> um, or. We're doing very well on time. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's only half past. Okay, so this is typically an hour? It, yes. That's yeah. great. Um, so changing gears quite a bit to this uh, new paper on elevation data um, that came out at uh, Sandy's anniversary, which, um, you know, it actually has nothing to do with the U.S. or Sandy, but an interesting time to be talking about sea level rise. So in a nutshell, um, so this paper was was produced by my colleagues, Benjamin Strauss, who's our CEO, and, and a, was the developer of our whole sea level rise program. Um, so it, it stands on the shoulders of giants, in this case you, um, or NASA at large, the SRTM data plus US LIDAR and um, develop, they developed um, an artificial intelligence neural network model to produce coastal dam validating with other US LIDAR and Austral Australian LIDAR. Um, so what, how many people have heard about this story? Just so I get a sense of the audience here. Okay, so about half. Um, so what Ben likes to say, and, and he does this very well, is that you know, there's there's so much uncertainty with sea level rise projections, and we are very certain about the trend, and we we have a good sense of the, the bounds, but um, we're never really going to know how much sea level rise is going to manifest um, at the global level, at the local level. There's just too much uncertainty with Antarctica in particular, but we 